Today we're going to go for a trip in the low country. Well, g'day and welcome to another episode of Warwick Naylor's Boomerang Adventures. I'm going to be going on a road trip today and I'm going to be sussing out, I think it's three different creeks or rivers and basically try a little bit of uh, fishing along the way. I don't actually get any fish, so I'll give you a heads up now. But there are plenty of other interesting things to see by a waterway. I know a few weeks ago, I think I mentioned that I was uh, going to be doing a episode on a dam uh, being filled up and water life sort of coming to life as the new uh, sort of environment changed and and all that but uh, it hasn't happened because it hasn't rained enough so it looked like it was going to rain a lot but it turns out that children and animals aren't the only things that can make a liar out of you on film so uh, yeah this is actually today's episode it's being shot over uh, I think, you know, three different outings and I hope that you enjoy it and uh, get something out of it because I did. It's always good to have a bit of a, a look around at some new areas and uh, a couple of these were new spots for me. So um, I'll see you at the end of the episode. Well, I'm at the... Uh, one of the biggest rivers in the country. This is the Murray River. A lot of people call it the mighty Murray River. Well, it is an Australian standard, so I suppose it's mighty. We don't get a lot of rain in the southern half of the country. And this is the major river that basically connects what's called the Murray-Darling Basin, collects all the water from several rivers along the way and ends up uh, going into the ocean down near Adelaide somewhere. And uh, I thought it'd be interesting to talk about these little billabongs that, that uh, form on the side. And a billabong is when the river floods, it spills over the banks, fills up these little depressions, and then um, traps uh, fish and stuff like that, and they breed. And then the next flood comes along, they catch those young fish, bring it back into the river, and the cycle continues. But this billabong is a little bit different in that it's captured some stormwater that hasn't run into the, the river because it hasn't been flooding and it's gone completely black and uh, disgusting. But there's still life in it and it's, I think there's turtles in here. I can see something splashing at times. But it's full of, it's black because it's full of tannin. And tannin's the stuff that comes out of the bark and the leaves. And people concentrate it and use it to tan skins. That's why when you turn a skin into leather, it's called tanning because it comes from the same word as tannin. And so that black look is, um, it's not like uh, rotten, it's just basically a dissolved bark and stuff that has leached out that tannin. So um, it does affect, it's like some fish can't live in here. I think carp could probably live in here, European carp, but it makes it harder for them to breathe in the water because it extracts the oxygen or it doesn't let the oxygen bind into the water properly and the fish can asphyxiate in this, in this sort of water. So typically you'll never catch fish in here. Um, certainly up to a certain concentration, um, fish will just start dying. And I think carp will be the last ones to die. But you will get turtles in here because they don't breathe the water. Obviously they, they come up and have a breath. All right, well, I'm in a slightly different area of the country, and um, this is a snake that we don't get at my place. It's a black snake, or this one's called a red belly black snake. He's been dead for a few hours because the flies are hanging around. He's been run over, I would say, a number of times. But they're called red belly black snake because they've got this, this red 
belly. It's quite pretty. If I can pick it up without it stinking all over my hands. There we are. So that's that red belly. It's even a bit more sort of iridescent when it's alive. And these are uh, a venomous snake. They not that aggressive, but um, they do have quite a bit of venom in their little venom pouch. So they don't go anywhere near these near these things when they're alive. But uh, yeah, you don't stir them up. But uh, yeah. I've never really been this close to one before. Interesting to have a look at it. Probably at one of the more interesting places in, uh, in on the New South Wales Victorian border. Still on the Murray River here, and um, we're at a place that's what's called a lock, and so it's a, a weir essentially, but also has a lock as well on it. And so the boats and other vessels can come down the river. And to get through from one side of the weir to the other, they come into this structure here called a lock, and they that that sort of footbridge there that's pulled out of the way, and that one over the top there that's lifted up with some hydraulics, and then the boats or whatever can come in there into that pool, very still looking water, and then that water is let out at the bottom on the other side and the boat goes down but they'll I'm guessing they'll block off this water here somehow it's about yeah six meters deep at the moment and so as the water goes down the boat can go down to the next level at the bottom of the weir without having to go down a, a rapid which wouldn't work very well with a nice big boat so that's the system of a lock and it's very very pretty always above the weir looks really nice and then below the weir doesn't look so good but that's where the fish hang out um yeah so an enormous structure and there's dozens of these weirs along the murray river system or the murray river itself i, I can't remember how many it goes up to might it go up to about 40 or something weirs all the way with locks. So that allows the traffic of the boats if they got um, goods or I'm not sure how much goods is being transported anymore so it's probably more for houseboats and things like that. But uh, they've kept the lock system and I've, it's just amazing the amount of engineering that's gone into this whole structure millions of dollars worth of, of engineering. So we're going to have a look around more and um, just show you some highlights of the whole spot. I don't think this would help very much. Now this is one of those fish ladders. I think they um, got the idea from Europe. Help the fish get from one side of the weir to the other without um, with harming the fish or having to do it manually. They can just go up this ladder and 
quite cleverly follow the structure all the way up or down, giving them access to the full length of the river. If they want to spawn down there and then go back up there to feed or whatever they can. And uh, they use this to catch carp, which is um, a European carp, which is obviously a noxious fish in Australia. And uh, they have a system over there to get them out. It's quite a clever thing to do, but um, I'm not sure how effective it is in Australia, but it's, uh, it looks good. So this is where they catch the fish. They call this the carp cage, according to that scientist around the corner. And I suppose at the end of the day, they, they pull out the carp and maybe other noxious fish that are in the river and they let the good ones go down the, the ladder, the fish ladder. And um, apparently they'll, they catch thousands of these in a year, um, noxious fish. That's kind of like a big drum net, um, big legal drum net. Be not a bad job to have actually. Catching fish all day. Oh, I'm just at the information centre at the Weir, and um, they've obviously planted some different types of native trees around here. And this is a Kwandong. This is a very famous Australian native uh, bush food and it's only just started to flower so I think these things are flowering later this year than what they usually do and it's got a beautiful red fruit about the size of a tombola and the seed sorry the seed isn't edible oh, actually no it has fruited already it's already dropped off it's just down here um, so that this, the husk is edible and the seed is not. So that red stuff there is what is where the nutrition is found. It's also nut right on the inside and I think you can eat that too. I haven't really heard people talking about that but this is a really high source of vitamin C and it is a traditional Aboriginal food and yeah I can taste that. <laughs> Full of vitamin C. Um, there's some hanging on the tree a little bit still. A couple there. They are they are native to the area. That one's actually a little bit soft still. Probably taste okay. So that's the classic Kwandong nut on the inside. It's got those ripples. And inside or that shell inside is the nut and that uh, I'm not sure if it's edible so I'm not about to try I can't remember but that's the edible bit that everybody likes and sometimes for sort of fancy things if you're involved in tea parties or whatever in Australia they'll, pro they'll produce these for everybody to eat and um, hmm, they're not bad actually Tastes a bit like a um, fruit leather. Essentially, it is. <laughs> cool. Oh well. Even know what you find, even if they plant it, you still find some bush tucker in an artificial place.
I'm at the, the lock uh, weir information centre, just uh, looking at all the history for the past, I don't know, when they set it up, late 1800s, and um, found one bit of interesting information, because my great grandfather settled uh, in this area in the 1870s, and it was the Land Act was passed in 1869 and large stations were broken up into areas of up to 320 acres. <clears throat> My great grandfather, he settled, uh, Hen Henry Naylor, he settled on 200 acres on the Gumbauer Creek and he chose that area because it was a really nice spot and um, he set up a dairy farm there and had he milked 20 cows a day so probably collected 200 litres a day and he sold cream and cheese and he also had a market garden and he would take that to uh, once a week down to a place called Chuka and sell it. Sell, uh, I'm not sure if he sold his cream and his cheese there but he sold his, um, he probably did, but he sold his uh, fruit and vegetables there as well because there's a port on the Murray River in Echuca. So, Sort of, it's a bit of um, very relevant history for my family learning about this sort of stuff. Just pulling in that net and um, I thought I was going to catch some shrimp but I haven't. I've caught two little fish and they're different types to each other and I was going to guess they'd be minnows but that one there it could be a young yellow belly or just a, um, it might even be a minnow. But this one here, that's very different. That could be a young Murray cod. And they're a um, sought after fish in, in Australia, on the, in the eastern side of Australia. And um, yeah, they, turn, they be, become huge. They're like a 50 kilogram or 100 pound plus fish. So I, I'll put him back in the water before I no, no more in there um, before it dies, so I'll let him go. Yep, no worries. Oh, that's good. All right, well, there's something in there, but not what I was chasing, so anyway, I'll have to stick with the lure for a bit longer.
I'm down at a river in Victoria called the Compaspe River. And I'm not far from where it comes out of a dam, a big dam called Lake Epilock. And it's supposed to be a number of good quality fish in the river. It's not a really big river, particularly here. It's quite small and not letting much water down the spillway. But I might catch a cod, Murray cod or yellow belly or possibly a redfin. And uh, using this little lure that looks like a bit like a frog, I think. It's a really pretty spot because just the way those trees come down that hill there and um, come down to the water's edge. This is a creek or a river that has. Uh, platypus in it and if you don't know what a platypus is it's one of two species that fit the uh, classification of a monotreme so it's a mammal that lays eggs and the platypus has got this uh, duck bill thing sort of like a duck and it goes under the water and it looks for freshwater crustaceans and uh, they're quite common around the southern half of the country in these types of rivers and creeks you have more chance of seeing them when it's on also dawn and dusk when they go in and out of their holes they often have their holes right at the water level, they're quite difficult to see and I haven't seen any here today. But they're supposed to be in this river, in this part of the country. But if we don't see them, which we probably won't, I might be able to catch a fish. We might try a few different spots today as we go downstream, work our way back which is really working our way north. So, I'm not sure if you can hear them or not, but we've got a whole lot of cicadas. Some people call them cicadas, but I think that's a bit toffy. There's a whole bunch of young eucalypts behind me, and it's a good home for cicadas and they're the world's loudest insect. And the one that is the loudest of the cicadas is found in Melbourne, just in the, in the parks around Melbourne and in Melbourne. And it's almost, it's deafening if you get too close to them, but they're pretty shy. They're a funny, funny sort of creature, very timid. But they don't mind letting you know where they are which, which tree they're in, but you'll be flat out to see. Because when they see you coming, they run around the other side of the branch. I'm not having much luck. This spot haven't even had a just a little touch or anything. So I'll probably go up to a couple of different spots and see what we can find. Here's one of those cicadas here. It's um, but it's only the shell. So as part of its development, they shed that skin and leave it behind. And it looks impressively just like the cicada. But he's popped out of his own back and. Got a new skin underneath and flew off. 
I think, I'm not actually sure of the cicada life cycle, but I think this is the juvenile that doesn't fly, and then it comes out of that shell and then it can fly. And there's another one right here. There's, they're all over the place here. And there's another one up here. And they're surprisingly strong, even though they're it's completely dead, dead shell. It's quite tough. They're stuck on there quite well. And there's another one up here. So they obviously hang out together in little families or colonies. Quite a good looking animal. It's actually a nice butterfly to see. Righty. Uh, off he goes. Yeah. Oh, it's good. You never know what you find when you go to a new area. I'm just very slowly working my way upstream and uh, hoping I can get a fish that's around these snags or something like that, but I notice just here there's um, a spot where the kangaroos come down, and I thought it might have been people, but this, the tracks are sort of coming out of strange spots down to the water, so these roos are flattening all this, these, um, whatever it is, tall grass here. And um, they probably lie, lie here in, in the morning when it's not so hot, when the sun's not on it. And um, just in here, they go right up to the edge and their footprints are in that mud and they get a drink at the water's edge there. So if you wanted to, you could just wait. And this is probably where they'd come down from these hills or that bank, come down, get a drink, and then go out for a feed for the night. They spend a lot of time gathering food at night. They're, they're pretty nocturnal kangaroos. Anyway, it's led me to my next spot, the Casta Lua. And that's the end of the footage, folks, because that's all I took. But I hope you enjoyed what I've put together for you. And don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you on the next episode.